Wonderful. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the Race to Rethink Plastic student learning session. I'm Emily with Enactus, and I'm so glad that you could join us today. So we are recording this session today, and it's going to be available for you to access later on the Race to Rethink Plastic Enactus Plus page. So if you need to reference it later, it will be there. We're also going to have a Q&A at the end of the session today. So if you have any questions that come up during the session, hang on to those or feel free to pop them in the chat box. We will be utilizing the chat to do the Q&A. So if you have a question, definitely put it in there and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can at the end. But if by chance your question doesn't get answered, you can always go to Enactus Plus and use the discussion forum there to post it as well. So to get things started, I'm so pleased to welcome Zinnia Escarcia from HiCone, one of our race sponsors. She's going to introduce our presenters today from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So Zenia, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Emily. And hello, everyone, and welcome to the Enactus Race to Rethink Plastic Student Learning session with the Helen MacArthur uh, Foundation. I would like to start by asking, why do we need to rethink plastic? Plastic have made an enormous contribution to human life from equipment in the medical field to packaging in the food and beverage industry. We need to keep plastic waste out of the environment. At HICON, we support initiatives to reduce waste and unnecessary packaging, as this will help us to move forward um, on our goal to uh, develop a circular economy. In addition to encouraging more recycling, better education, and improve recycling systems. HICON is a leading global supplier of ring carrier multi-packaging system. We are committed to promoting recycling and advancing the circular economy to reduce, recycle, and reuse plastic so that it becomes a valuable resources rather than waste. HICON is investing in recycling infrastructure globally where LDPE plastics cannot be easily recycled through our free ring recycle bee program. For example, in the UK, we are partnering with TerraCycle to reclaim ring carriers which is the first manufacturer-led re recycling program globally. And we are also working with Avangard Innovative in the US, Mexico, and Canada to collect and recycle green carriers and turn them into new green carriers. We also develop partnerships across the supply chain to, to drive a circular economy, including the Helen MacArthur Foundation. And in, and in October of this year, we recently joined the US Plastic Pact led by the Recycling Partnership and World Wildlife Fund in partnership with the Helen MacArthur Foundation. Today, I'm thrilled to present two guest speakers who are experts in the field on how we need to rethink plastic. Juliet Lennon and Garen Spallinger are part of the Helen MacArthur Foundation. And in the next 45 minutes, you will learn what the circular economy is and what a circular economy for plastics looks like. Juliet Lennon, she's the project manager at the New Plastics Economy. Juliet supports the Plastics Pack Network of national initiatives. She facilitates cross-value chain communication and collaboration within national and regional initiatives that bring together key stakeholders to drive collective action, implementing solutions to build a circular economy for plastics. Garen Spallinger, she is the Plastics Pack Coordinator. Garen supports the Plastic Pack Net Network she facilitates the exchange of learnings and best practices between PACs in different countries and regions across the world. Let's get some insights from these two extraordinary speakers. Please welcome Juliet Lennon and Garen Spallinger. Thanks, Xenia, for the introduction. Uh, it's really great to be here with you today. And thanks also to Emily and Sheila and the Enactus team for inviting us um, today. So as Xenia really um, well said. Um, I'm joining here today with Juliet. We're both from the New Plastics Economy team at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And just to give you a little bit of background, so the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is a charity based on the Isle of Wight in the UK. So Juliet is joining today from the Isle of Wight. I myself am in London. And the mission of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. We work with businesses, governments, and academia to build a framework for an economy that is restorative and regenerative by design. So with that in mind, let's get started and let's dive right deep into the session. And I'm going to start with a story. So imagine, it is January 1925. It is New Year in the lake city side, lakeside city of Geneva and Christmas lights are up all over the city. 
Meanwhile, representatives from the world's leading light bulb manufacturer are gathered in a small room and are coming to a collective decision. In order to save their industry, they agree to limit the lifespan of their light bulbs to a thousand hours, which is significantly below what they were capable of producing at that time. And today, many look back and consider this particular moment of these manufacturers being reunited in this small room and take the, taking this particular decision to have been the first case of planned obsolescence, which is the intentional reduction of the lifespan of a product in order to increase sales. And that decision was made based on an economic system that is built on the idea of repetitive consumption, so buying light bulbs again and again which is the foundation of our modern economy. In order to sell more stuff and keep the economy growing, we have to take more resources from the ground, make all of that into the many different products people want, and then when those products are no longer needed or no longer wanted, they are disposed of. It is a take, make, waste, linear economy. Resources are going in at the beginning and waste is coming out at the end. And this linear system has brought great prosperity and we have enjoyed incredible technological innovations as a result and have access to nearly anything we can imagine at quick time scale and low cost. However, this is where things start to go wrong for the linear economy. Firstly, it doesn't make very effective use of resources, which we know are limited. If we look at a product like a car, the average European car spends 92% of its life parked. That is an incredibly ineffective use of the materials we have available to us. Not only that, but it's incredibly wasteful and our environment is suffering as a result. If we think about something like the recycling symbol, that has been around for nearly 40 years. But at the end of the day, we only collect around 14% of plastic packaging around the world. And only 2% of that gets recycled in a closed loop system with a staggering one third ending up in the environment. And from an economic perspective, every product and all of the material that ends up in landfill gets incinerated or ends up in the ocean is wasted money. All that labor, energy and time that went into making that is thrown away. And thinking about plastic specifically, after a relatively short use cycle, approximately 95% or 80 to 120 billion US dollars is lost to the economy each year. So with this ineffective and wasteful use of resources, the linear economy is not working for our planet or our growing population. And so far, most of the focus has been on how can we do less bad? Often the first thought is, can we use less? Can we be more resource efficient? How can we reduce the negative impact and negative externalities of the linear economy and perhaps make this line a little bit thinner? Well, that's an okay place to start, but it's not gonna work in the long term. We're still using up resources just at a slower pace. Yes, we'll buy ourselves some time, but it's not enough. It's still a linear system. It's still wasteful. The second thought is typically then, okay, well, can we improve waste management? Can we clean up our oceans? Can we recycle more? And while these actions might address some of the issues, by themselves, none of these approaches will solve the problem because they're treating the symptoms rather than the root cause of the issue. Think about it like this. If you came, if you came home and your kitchen sink was overflowing with water, would you run and get a bucket and a mop and try and clean up all that water pouring onto the floor? Or would you stop and try and turn off the tap? With all of its inefficiency, waste and pollution, the linear take make waste way of doing things can no longer support our growing population. The system needs to change entirely. And at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we asked ourselves, what would a good system look like? And what we came up with is the circular economy, which provides an alternative system and fundamentally rethinks the way we design, use and reuse products and materials. So changing the system means doing things completely differently. What if instead of selling as many light bulbs as possible, like those companies back in 1925 in Geneva, 
you could sell light itself. So light itself would become the product instead of the light bulb. Philips Lightning, which is now called Signify, is doing exactly this at places like Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands. So the light required to illuminate the space is provided as a service and the customer pays for the light use and Signify has ownership of the light fittings which have been designed to be long lasting and durable and that ultimately will be returned, reused, refurbished or recycled by Signify. And it's very different from designing light bulbs to fail. It's a completely different model. So what does the circular economy look like? This change is one example of a model that works entirely differently to today's system. It is a circular model. And what we intend by circular economy is a system based on three principles. The first one is design out waste and pollution rather than treating the symptoms and deal with waste once it is, once it is created. The second one is keep the products and materials in use at their highest possible value for as long as possible. And the third one is regenerate natural systems rather than extracting value out of our natural environment to make as many products as possible. Why not rethink the way of operating to increase the health of natural systems? So these three principles are the foundation for a system that can work in the long term, a system we call the circular economy. And circular economy offers the opportunity for a completely new way of viewing growth, moving away from creating value in extractive ways and instead growing the most restorative and regenerative ways. It is a vision for a future which works within the limits of our planet. And we are on this journey from linear to circular and momentum is building. Juliet, can you tell us a little bit more about who is seizing this momentum of circular economy and who sees this opportunity? Yes, it is not just the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. In 2015, the European Commission adopted an ambitious circular economy action plan, which it's since built on. We're seeing businesses from across industry exploring the circular economy as a source of value creation, from Google to Renault, from Philips to H&M, and Hycone, the sponsors of the event. And last year, BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, launched the first circular economy investment fund, and they've now raised more than 900 million US dollars in the first year, growing from just 20 million US dollars seed funding. And thinking about plastic packaging for a moment, today, nearly everyone everywhere in the world comes into contact with plastic packaging every single day. And plastic packaging is great. It has many benefits. It's protective, it's lightweight, it's economical, but plastic packaging has become perhaps the most iconic example of the take make waste linear system and the drawbacks of this system are becoming increasingly visible. According to our research, if we continue on this trajectory by 2050, there'll be more plastics than fish in the ocean. It's clear that the system needs to change, but going from today's linear system to a circular economy for plastics is a major shift. And to show that this shift is actually possible, we started the New Plastics Economy Initiative. We decided to focus on this one specific material flow, that is plastics, and our ambition is to set the global economy on an irre irreversible path towards a future where plastics never become waste. Changing a global system is not that easy and it requires a completely new approach, one where the entire value chain, all actors in the system, collaborate, where actions are taken with the perspective of this entire system in mind. And over the last four years, we have started to build momentum behind a circular economy for plastics across the world and from all actors, so plastic producers, brands, retailers, recyclers, governments, academic, investors, students also. In fact, today we have more than a thousand organizations united behind our vision for a circular economy for plastics. And by endorsing this vision of a circular economy for plastics, these thousand organizations explicitly recognize 
and it's really important that today's plastic waste crisis is not just a waste man management issue. They recognize that while recycling is a part of the solution, it's not the only solution and we won't recycle our way out of this issue. Together, they have committed to fundamentally rethink the way we design, use and reuse packaging by eliminating all problematic and unnecessary plastic items that we don't need, innovating to ensure that the plastics we do need are safely reused, recycled or composted, and finally, circulating all the plastic items effectively so that they stay out of the environment and are kept in the economy. And achieving this, this ambitious vision requires unprecedented levels of collaboration and innovation, both at global level and at national level. So at global level, in collaboration with the UN environment, we launched the new plastics economy global commitment in October 2018. And this global commitment draws a line in the sand in the fight against plastic waste and pollution. The global commitment has now brought together over 500 organizations around the world, collectively representing over 20% of the global plastics packaging value chain, from Coca-Cola to Unilever, from Apple to ASOS, and they're all together behind that common vision Garance just talked about for how to address today's plastic issues. And they have transparent and public progress reporting every year. And given we need to change a global system with many stakeholders involved, all aligning behind this one common vision is a crucial first step. But the global commitment is about much more than endorsing a vision. All businesses and governments in the commitment have also set very specific targets to 2025 to achieve that vision and are currently conducting actions to get there and reporting their progress every year. Last year, we published the first report, which established the baseline data and an unprecedented level of global transparency. This year, actually just last week, we published the second report, the cover, which you're looking at now. And it measures the evolution of progress for the first time. Feel free to go check it out. It also goes hand in hand with a database where you can browse company by company and see the data for each individual organization. And while it's crucial to have this common vision and global action, the way we get there and the actual solutions on the ground will be different from Chile to the US, from South Africa to Portugal. In Chile, for instance, recycling infrastructure is not as developed as that of much of Europe. And there's a really important aspect, which is the informal waste sector, meaning that there are waste pickers that collect waste and will bring them to either recycling plants or buyback centers. And because Chile does not have as much existing recycling infrastructure, it actually presents fantastic opportunities to innovate, to look upstream before those products even arrive on the market for alternative delivery models like reuse, for example. So there's a clear need for on the ground solutions that are tailored to each and every local context. And that is why alongside this global level action of the global commitment, we have a network of plastics packs all around the world. Today, we have nine plastics packs, as you can see here, in North America, Latin America, Europe, and Africa. Together, they cover 20 countries, representing over 30% of GDP. And further packs are in development in Asia Pacific, Africa, and North America. And each of these plastics pacts is led by a local organization. They bring together the key stakeholders at national level, businesses, governments, NGOs, and other key stakeholders to work towards the vision and drive action on the ground, implementing local solutions. So we've started to talk about action and solutions. You might be wondering, well, what's actually happening in practice? So through the new plastics economy, global commitment, but also the plastics pact, we are actually starting to see some initial action being taken towards the circular economy for plastics. I'm just going to highlight a couple of examples, but if you want to know more, I would really encourage you to go and check the latest uh, global commitment progress report on our website. The first thing we see, and we have here a very interesting example, is elimination. 
we see that businesses are eliminating the most commonly identified problematic packaging categories in their portfolio. So such as PS, PVC, undetectable carbon black, and they're going even further. And the way companies eliminate these items are either very straightforward, so just removing wraps for, for instance, multi buy cans, but they can also be innovation led, such as the examples, the example that you see here on the slide. It's a company called APIL. They produce an edible plant-based coating that keeps products fresh for two or three times longer compared to non-coated non -coated produce. And it, so it can, it's really interesting because it can reduce food wastage, but without the need for any packaging, because in the end, you will, you will eat this, coat, uh, this coating. And talking about elimination, we see real commitment to reduce plastic. So many signatories such as packaged good producers or retail signatories have set targets in place to reduce virgin plastic in packaging or reduce plastic packaging altogether. So for instance, Unilever that you might, you might all be very familiar with, they committed to reduce the, the use of virgin plastics in packaging by 50% by 2025. But we also see changes to packaging design, which are really interesting. So through color, format, or material choices that then increase recyclability. For instance, what you see here on the slide is uh, the Sprite example. So Sprite bottles um, in Europe and in Southeast Asia were turned from green to clear, and it actually improves uh, really highly the value of recycling. And another area of progress we see is the increase in incorporation of recycled content. So plastic that is recycled and incorporated in new plastic packaging. But once again, if you're interested in all of this, I would really recommend uh, you to go check our latest global commitment progress report on our website. And most excitingly, or at least what uh, most excites us is that we see the signatories models we see, I mean, we see signatories which rethink the delivery of products, allowing to move from single use to reuse. One example which uh, we might, you might be familiar with is Loop. Loop is a platform where you can buy everyday products like ice cream and shampoo, but in redesigned superior packaging that you then return to the businesses for them to clean, refill and reuse. And through Loop, you can see great examples of how through packaging redesign, you can improve the user experience. So for instance, one of, one of these examples is a Hagen dazs ice cream tube made of steel. So you can fall asleep watching a movie with your ice cream and then you wake up and it's still frozen. And then you return this packaging to Loop. Another really exciting example from a completely different context is Algramo. Algramo is a startup from Chile piloting a dispensing system on wheels with Nestle and Unilever. It's a tricycle that is solar powered and will turn up in front of your door so that you can go out, refill your detergent, your pet food in the quantities that you desire. Thanks, Garas. So these are just some examples of action that's being taken to move towards a circular economy for plastics around the world we are on a journey there is no one simple solution or quick fix and we're seeing organizations taking significant action and yet we need to see that continue at speed and scale and be increasingly bold and ambitious to match the scale of the problem there's currently huge momentum as governance businesses and citizens are mobilizing towards a world where plastic never becomes waste. And to make the transition to a circular economy for plastics, we need to fundamentally change the system. And to do that, we need both upstream solutions, so that might be material selection, packaging design, new business models like reuse examples that Garance just shared, but also elimination, being able to deliver that product or that same functionality but without packaging at all and downstream solutions uh, like recycling but we need both of these to achieve the circular economy because recycling alone will not be enough to solve this problem so we see that there is a need to further increase the ambition to go beyond recycling 
So better recycling is vital and we're seeing a lot of encouraging efforts to improve recyclability of packaging, increase recycling capacity and also incorporate more recycled content. But to address plastic waste and pollution, these efforts on recycling need to be matched by similar investment and ambition level on this full solution space. So that includes elimination and reuse. And there's also an opportunity for a more fundamental innovation-led elimination agenda. So this goes back to what Garance was saying earlier. It's not just about getting rid of those most commonly identified problematic items like PVC or items like straws and stirrers. There's many exciting opportunities for this innovation-led elimination like the APL coating on that cucumber we saw. And it's about thinking about the product and the packaging design, the business models, the supply chain. And a few other examples of that include um, a retailer, Ahold Delheiser, which is using dry misting technology in its supply chain to keep fruit and vegetables fresh without the need for packaging. But we're also seeing things like Danon in Indonesia launching a new water bottle line for their aqua bottles where the logo is integrated into the bottles. They don't need a label anymore. So while there are many solutions out there, we definitely don't have all the answers yet. But we have a clear vision for what the future should look like. Before we open up to your questions, there are some really common ones that we hear all the time. So we'd like to just uh, talk about a few of them now. Garance, I'd love to just come to you and say, you know, based on all of this, wouldn't it just be easier to ban all plastics and replace them with other materials like glass or paper or aluminium? Yes, thanks, Juliet. That's a question that um, we hear a lot. So in some cases, switching to an alternative material or eliminating some plastic packaging entirely can actually make a lot of sense. However, there can also be unintended consequences. So for instance, a different material might have a larger environmental footprint due to the way it's made or produced. Um, it might have higher carbon emissions with its transportation. So for instance, glass is heavier than plastics. So we need to consider all these impacts throughout the entire life of the packaging and the system it is part of. And given its versatility, plastic is expected to continue to be used for various applications. So the best approach is really to think about the system the plastic is evolving in and design a plastic system that actually works and in which the plastic never becomes waste or pollution. So with this in mind, I now have a question for you, Juliet. Um, another thing we hear a lot is that, uh, yeah, so if we cannot eliminate all plastic, then some people might be wondering, why don't we just make all plastics compostable or biodegradable? Yeah, it's a really common question. And I think the first important thing is to clarify Actually, there's a big difference between compostable and biodegradable. So if something is biodegradable, it means that it can be broken down into carbon dioxide, water and biomass by the natural action of microorganisms. But for plastics, this term is not very meaningful or well defined because it doesn't actually give us any information about the length of time over which that process should occur or the conditions under which that needs to occur. So a much better defined term is compostable. There are many international and also local standards that define this for plastic items. And so this term tells us that the packaging item can break down into carbon dioxide, water and biomass within a specific time frame under specific control conditions. So now that's clarified, it's also worth saying that Compostable plastics are not a one-size-fits-all, quick-fix, silver bullet solution to plastic pollution. And actually, they should only be used for very specific, targeted applications. And where they are used, they need to be coupled with the appropriate collection and composting infrastructure. So 
the use of compostable plastic should be supported by infrastructure to ensure that packaging gets composted in practice and doesn't just become pollution in the environment or in some cases we want to avoid the fact that it might contaminate recycling of recyclable plastics. So some examples of targeted applications could be compostable tea bags, compostable bags for compost collection in cities, uh, packaging materials that often end up in organic waste streams that could be fruit and vegetable labels, fast food packaging, things like that. So appreciating that actually we are only looking to have compostables for targeted applications. Garance, I want to come back to you because the follow on question is usually, well, should we just not recycle everything then? <laughs> So, uh, the recycling symbol has been introduced 40 years ago, and I, you, as you rightly said at the beginning of the presentation, Juliet, um, since then, so since 40 years, we've seen uh, that recycling rates have been incredibly low and progress has been really slow. So currently, only around 14% of plastic packaging is collected for recycling globally. And without fundamental redesign and innovation, about 30% of plastic packaging will never be reused or recycled. So recycling is definitely a part of the solution, but as we said before, it is not the only solution. We also need upstream solutions and we won't recycle our way out of the plastic pollution crisis. The volume of plastic packaging that currently goes into the recycling system is just too much and too complex we must reduce the amount of waste that goes in the recycling system, and we also need to simplify the material flow that goes in it. So that being said, uh, I'd like now to address the elephant in the room. So Juliet, we saw over the past month that we saw reports saying that COVID uh, lives longer in plastic than other materials, and we also saw many people in the supermarket going back to single-use plastic packaging. So how do we safely respond to COVID-19 when we see all of this? What's the answer? <laughs> it's a big <laughs> question. Um, it's a really good point. And I think this one also links a lot to reuse. And, you know, we've been talking and mentioning throughout this that reuse is a big part of the solution, but how do we then do that in COVID times? So um once we've eliminated all the problematic and unnecessary items as as is part of the vision reusable packaging models should then be explored as a way to design out waste from the outset in instances where packaging is going to be used and un because unlike recycling reuse models um, not only keep the material in the economy, but that entire packaging, so all that embedded energy and value is kept in the system. So it's often referred to as the inner loop of uh, the circular economy. But crucially, hygiene and safety are an important part of actually any packaging system, whether it's single use or reuse. And hygiene and safety is actually not determined by whether an item is disposable or reusable, but it's about how that packaging and the containers are managed and handled. And during the pandemic, one of the things that's emerged is um, more science and guidance from public health professionals. So there was one report that came out from over 100 scientists from across 18 countries. And also it was supported by public bodies like the European Commission, and they actually found that the evidence is in favor of the ability to safely continue to use reusable packaging systems while navigating the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond by just continuing to employ the basic hygiene standards. And it's actually worth saying that some of these reuse models, so Garance mentioned Al Gramo in Chile, we've also seen Loop and other examples have actually massively increased their sales during the COVID-19 pandemic and they've not had to actually adjust their safety or hygiene protocols at all as far as we understand because they were already in place and they're already meeting uh, the standards. So it's actually really reassuring. Um, so maybe the last one, back to you Garance, is Based on all of this, can you just tell us and, and remind us, how does plastic fit in a circular economy? 
Well, I would hope that everyone who attended the presentation should be able to answer that question by now. <laughs> but just to recap very quickly, in a circular economy, we keep products and materials in use and circulate them at their highest value at all times. This implies that plastic packaging is reused when possible, so by circulating the packaging product, then recycle when it has already been reused quite a few times, so circulating the packaging materials. So materials, components, products and services should be designed to be reused or recycled back into new products or materials kept in the economy. Great. So we have covered a lot of information from the circular economy to the circular economy for plastics, as well as some solutions. And we know that it can be a lot to process and take in. So we just wanted to show you some of our learning assets so you can go and find out more in your own time if you want to. We have an online learning hub, which I believe is probably already being shared with you where you can go through the plastics journey. Uh, we've also put in here some links to all of our reports. So feel free to go to our website, browse around. All of our reports are completely free to download and often available in multiple languages as well. Um, we've mentioned the Global Commitment Progress Report. Would really encourage you to go look at the summary. You can see how far organizations have come on the journey and how far they still have to go to 2025. And um, a sneak peek for you, we have an upstream innovation book coming next week and you will find loads of inspiring ideas on elimination, reuse, there's over 100 case studies and examples in there. So hopefully you'll find that really interesting to get started with innovation and that mindset. Um, but we also know that not everybody learns in the same way. So if reading is not your thing and you prefer to go watch, we have also got you covered. So we put some links here, but go to our YouTube tap channel. Sir David Attenborough, which we're very excited about, has done a video which breaks down the problem and the solutions. We've got Jessie Buckley, uh, who was in Wild Rose and a number of other things, in her dulcet tones, talking you through the vision. Leela, our colleague, gives you a world tour of upstream innovation solutions. I'm on there interviewing Nestle and Walmart if you want to hear more from me about their journey to 2025, but um, there's a lot more on there. So just encourage you in, uh, when you've got time, just go have a look. Thanks, Juliet. And to be honest, I can only really echo what you say. I was a student only one and a half year ago and I used a lot of the foundation's resources, which are really extraordinary and really enable you to learn so much. Um, so just to wrap up, Quickly before we move on to the Q&A, uh, we were invited here today to talk to you as you embark upon your journeys and careers uh, and as you will be the people who will be making the future decisions in organization. And as such, I really encourage you to think beyond where we are today. Think beyond making small tweaks in the linear system. Think outside of what is the best solution in our current system. Ask yourself, can your product be delivered in a completely new way? Does it need packaging at all? Is the current packaging the best for this product? I really encourage you to be bold in questioning, rethinking, and proposing solutions to change the linear system we live in and look for circular economy solutions. And there's a sentence we really like in the New Plastics Economy team, which is, the question is not whether a world without plastic waste or pollution is possible, but what we will do together to make it happen. So that being said, I would like to thank you and maybe ask Emily if we saw any questions coming in the chat. And if not, we really encourage you to ask your questions or maybe even jump in to ask them. Uh, we still have, I think, 10 or 15 minutes to answer them. So we'd be glad to pick them up. Yes, thank you so much, Julia Ingerantz, for your wonderful presentation today. It was awesome. Well, I don't see too many questions coming in yet. Oh, I spoke too soon. We've already got some populated here in the chat. So what I will do is I will look and share questions with them. So if any of you have a question, don't hesitate to put it in the chat and we will get to as many as we can. So we'll go ahead and get started with this first one from a student in India. It says, we have an Enactus project in our college which aims to reduce plastic bags with recycled cloth and canvas bags, but we always get asked, will replacing plastic bags with cloth, cotton or polycotton, 
will those bags make any difference? So they'd like to know if you have any thoughts on replacing a plastic bag with like a canvas or cotton bag. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think we kind of covered this question a little bit by saying that earlier, um, when you think about substituting plastics with another material, you always have to think, to really take this step back and think from a system perspective, taking into account all the unintended consequences of actually substituting your plastic with a cotton or poly cotton bag. So where does this cotton come from? Does it like, what, what are, what, where has it been produced? What's the impact? How is it, um, how is it collected? And is it, uh, yeah, is it discharged? So I think, yeah, you always need to think about the system perspective and the potential unintended consequences that might happen with the substituting from plastic to cotton. Juliet, do you want maybe to add something? To I think answer? it's a, a great introduction. And I, I think the only thing to add is also completely, as Garen said, thinking upstream on all those decisions that go into actually putting that bag on the market, whatever material it is. And in any case, can you also incorporate some recycled content into that? Because by doing that, you reduce the need for new virgin plastic or other materials. And then it's also thinking about what happens after. So maybe if I use a plastic bag multiple times, I use a cotton bag multiple times, where can it then go? Is it made out of something that can be then recycled to hopefully then go back thinking about closing that loop into bags again so it's always as garen said take a step back think about the system all the way before it goes to the market and then afterwards awesome so our next question is about recycling so the question is does reusing plastic not just extend the lifestyle of the plastic so is it eventually unusable so i think the question is is within the life cycle of plastic, as you continue to recycle it, does it reach a point where it can no longer be recycled? Um, I think it's worth unpacking maybe also the terms reuse and recyclable there. So maybe starting with reuse. So for things like reuse, we talk about it meaning that you're using that product for the same application over and over and over again. So if we think about a very specific example, uh, in uh, South America and now in South Africa, Coke have introduced their Coca-Cola universal bottles, which are like two liter bottles made out of PT plastic, but slightly thicker. And basically if you buy it, you get a deposit on that. So I take it home, I drink my beverage, I bring it back and actually Coke then takes it back to be um, like cleaned, refilled and resold. And I get money off my next purchase. So it incentivizes you bring it back. That's reuse. And after it's gone through a number of reuse cycles, it's actually then designed to be recycled. So ideally, when we think about reuse, you want to design it to after it's completed, it's many, many loops of that same application, it's then recycled. Similarly, there's then that technical question you're asking about um, kind of material degradation over time. And it's true that uh, with um, mechanical recycling over time you will get um, material losses you know there's lots of different in the process things can happen it will degrade the quality so this is why we always talk about uh, bringing it back to the vision we want to keep products and materials in use at their highest possible value for as long as possible so if you think about something like again a PET bottle we want to design that to be mechanically recycled and ideally go back to being a new PET bottle many, many times. And then over many, many cycles of recycling, as it gets to grade, that it can then go into uh, cascaded recycling to other lower value applications. But the aim is always to start going as high value as possible. And as you go through the cascade, it's also about thinking, whatever it then goes to, can we make sure that can then be recycled at that level many, many times before going down and down? So that's the idea about keeping it in the technical cycle. Awesome, so, yeah, and, oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, just building on that, I saw another question in the chat, uh, which was asking, if we use plastics waste that can be reused with another material that is one of the waste, example like construction waste, would it be a good project? And I think it builds uh, exactly on what Juliet was saying, ideally, um, taking the plastic and putting it back into plastic packaging is the preferred look 
of the circular economy. And if you then take this plastic and put it into construction waste, for instance, you're kind of cascading this plastic to another use. So ideally, the plastic is really kept into the, the economy by keeping being kept into this loop of going from plastic packaging to plastic packaging. Wonderful. So I see a couple of questions we have. I'm going to actually combine a few because I think they're touching on a similar topic. So I think sometimes teams run into problems where that maybe their government in their country is not really on board with the transition to a circular economy or maybe businesses in their area aren't familiar or don't understand all of the ins and outs. Do you have any solid tips about how to start the conversation about a circular economy or if there is a great place to start to say take government action or maybe working with a business? Do you have any tips you'd share on that front? Do you have anything you want to share, Gilles, or I'm happy to, to start off? Go ahead. Um, I think it's always a question, right? Because it's like, how as, how as a student do I engage with government? Do I engage with businesses? I think what we would recommend is like, as a first point, it's always helpful to understand who's already on this journey. As we mentioned, there are now over 1,000 organizations around the world committed to this. There are some major FMCGs, big organizations that you will all recognize who are often present in you know, many, many markets. For example, I'm currently working in, in um, the Pacific Islands and you know, some of the big FMCGs still touch there, right? So even if it's a very small uh, place, those organizations are still committed at the global level. So it's, I would say it's often worth go to the global commitment site. We have a list of all the signatories and it's helpful to make the link back to them in terms of, you know, hey, I see you're signed up to the global commitment. You've got 2025 targets to achieve the circular economy for plastics. And this is, and that's then how you can start the conversation because they're already committed. So it's about linking it to what they're already doing. Similarly, we're working with governments around the world um, uh, through both the global commitment and the local plastics packs. And you can see all of those who are signed up. There's now over 20. Um, we've still got a long way to go, but that it's, it's a starting point. Um, and I think, you know, it is important and you'll see, and a question we often get asked is, you know, why are you not doing more with customers? Why are you just, why are you engaging with businesses and governments? But actually, they're the ones who have real potential to be a massive part of the solution in terms of changing the way they design, use and reuse their products. So engaging with them in conversations is, is really, really great. And the last thing I would say is we see a lot of these really open to solutions to solve these problems. We see a lot of these organizations running innovation prizes or sponsoring innovation prizes that are open to, you know, students or, you know, startups, emerging innovators, governments as well, running these kind of research grants and innovation prizes. So they're also a really great place to look because often as a result of those, you'll see organizations then partnering with them. So not to bang on about our grandma again, but actually because it was shown just to say they started, uh, it looked very different to the tricycle that you saw today. It was a much smaller startup. And then they partnered because of an innovation prize with Nestle, with Unilever, and it's just built and built from there. So that's a really great avenue to look as well. And just to build on this, maybe one thing that we always try to do is, is to really show also to businesses what's the economic opportunity that is actually lying in the in the circular economy and there is a really interesting comment in the chat about the fact that um with the covid and the um, the current context and the current uncertainty also businesses now maybe don't want to invest into circular economy models or reuse models and one thing that is really interesting that we saw is that the um, Coke reusable bottle model that Juliet talked to you about just a minute ago, um, actually during the pandemic, we saw that this um, product, so the, reus the re reusable bottle, is one of the products that actually was most resilient to the pandemic. So customers continued to purchase this Coke reusable bottle. So actually, this is really proof that uh, reusable models and circular economy models are really resilient to crisis. And it's another argument on top to show that the, the circular economy actually has economic benefits. Sorry to jump in again. I'm sure you have another question, but I just want to just finish the point on this one because actually Gareth set me up perfectly. It's that uh, during the pandemic, 
uh, we actually, um, there was a joint statement released through the Ella MacArthur Foundation in the Financial Times, and it, you can find it on our webpage or the Financial Times page, and over 50 of the biggest CEOs from businesses, also key policymakers, academics, and others, signed this global statement, which was actually saying, um, it is time to basically step up, not step back. The circular economy presents a massive opportunity to build back better, to build an economy that is more resilient to future shocks, that's regenerative, that has better opportunities to address climate, create jobs and all these things. And I guess from our perspective, it's incredibly reassuring to see that. And specifically on plastics, we have not seen any organisations either saying that they want to lower their commitment, they want to step out of their commitment. We've actually pe seen people set even more ambitious commitments because they see the, the need for this and the need to go quicker and to go bigger because we need to address this problem. Wonderful. So we, let's see, I think you just answered one of the questions I had, so we will actually go ahead and hop on to the next one. So let's see. The, the latest question is, are there any downsides in recycling plastic? So when you think about people, you know, usually we think of this recycling as a good thing. Are there any downsides to recycling plastic that you think are worth mentioning? For me, uh, and Garon's happy to defer to you after, it's less about downsides of recycling itself and it's more about thinking, I know I've said it a few times, but the scale of the problem and the solution space and how actually, there are many other things you can do before we get to recycling. So it's, it's, I want to be very clear, like recycling is a vital part of the solution. We need to design things to be actually recyclable, not just theoretically, technically in a lab somewhere, like in practice and at scale. And we need to increase recycling capacity and we need to incorporate more recycled content back into packaging because of that. But actually, the overwhelming body of evidence shows we can't just recycle everything. We need to do other things. And a great study to point you guys towards, if you haven't heard of it already, is the Breaking the Plastic Wave study that was published by Pew Charitable Trust and Systemic earlier this year. And we were a key thought partner. And it basically lays out all this different modeling for if we went as hard as we can on recycling only, or if we go as hard as we can on reuse only, or you know, all the different solutions compared to business as usual, where will we be in 2040? And it shows the only way to match the problem is to use a comprehensive circular economy approach. So it's less about why is recycling bad and more about we need to pull all the levers, all the solution space at the same time. We need to eliminate, we need to get rid of anything that's just unnecessary and also anything that's problematic. So is it hindering the recycling process? Does it end up in the oceans? Is it, does it have hazardous chemicals, things like that? Then everything that's left, we need to innovate. We need to think about designing it to be reusable, alternative business models, recyclable or compostable, and then circulating all of it, which is where the material circulation side of recycling and composting comes into play. Great. So the next question I have for you is some of our teams are working with companies or different organizations about transitioning from, you know, maybe that linear economy model into a more circular. Do you have any tips on starting the conversation about a circular economy? I know you've got some amazing resources on your website, but if teams are wanting to really share their story about why this is important, help to get some of those organizations or companies on board, do you have any tips for them about how to maybe have some of those conversations or at least get it started? Yeah, I think, I mean, to be honest, I think stories are always very powerful. So we love to share the light bulb story because it can ground it or bring things to life. But I think in general, when you're doing any kind of engagement, some kind of grounding in a, in a story is great. And then I also think it's about linking it to facts. I think, you know, obviously, if we transition to a circular economy for plastic, it shows that it's going to be uh, better for you know climate change in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions it's better for jobs it's better for the economy but it's about grounding it in those statistics and also building the case of momentum so talking to them about you know it's not only us who are saying it it's not only me look at these thousands of organizations that are doing it look at these governments that have committed and being able to link it and basically 
uh, build the undeniable truth that a this is happening the the you know the data the analysis shows that it is the right solution and it's not only me telling you that all these organizations around the world businesses policymakers uh, governments ngos are all saying it and so this is why i'm bringing my solution and that helps and you know making that bridge to so what how does that help um i think is uh, really effective great thank you so much so I know we weren't able to get to everybody's questions today, but we are reaching the top of the hour. So I would like to thank everybody so much for joining us today for the session. And Juliette and Garance and Zinnia, thank you so much for participating today. We really appreciate it. Students, if any of your questions weren't answered, we do encourage you to head over to the discussion forum on Enactus Plus. You can access that through the Race to Rethink Plastic page. And if you have any questions, you're always welcome to contact us at races at enactus.org as well via email. We're always happy to help. We're happy to help with project questions or... So sorry about that. Um, you're always welcome to reach out. Let's just, um, okay. So you can contact us with any questions and don't forget the deadline to enter the race is December 1st. So we did extend the deadline. So we are very excited to have you all participating and make sure to get your entry in on time. And as I said, don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions, post in the discussion forum, check out the resources on Enactus Plus, and we can't wait to um, engage you further in the race throughout the rest of the year and into the next one. So thank you guys so very much. We appreciate it. Thank you.